Hello, I want to tell you a little bit about language-oriented business applications. So I'll talk about business agility first and then I'll introduce language workbenches and JetBrains MPS. These are the core ingredients to language-oriented business applications. Then I'll give you a few examples and a demo and then we'll conclude with a big picture and a summary. So business agility. What you really want is that as the world changes around you, your business, your business environment, as that changes, you want these changes to be reflected in your software system. In fact, of course, in practice, things are a bit different. Um, there are business analysts which try to understand how the world changes. Then they put their knowledge into a Word document or other informal things, right? That is then handed to developers who will then code the system. A much better situation would be this one, where the business analyst can directly you know, the person who understands the domain can directly put their stuff into the software system. We still need the first arrow that goes from the earth, from the world, from the environment to the analyst. We cannot automatically, easily at least, uh, put that into the software itself. We need to uh, have it structured in some way, but we want this to be done directly by the person who understands the business. So to do that, um, that business analyst needs to have some kind of tool with which he can express his domain knowledge. It needs to uh, have a user-friendly notation so that, you know, he's not scared away by, you know, programmy things. Uh, he needs to be able to test what he wrote down. He needs to be able to express tests. He should be able to run meaningful analyses about the consistency of what he has done. And then, of course, in the end, you want to synthesize the software system itself. Now, you could argue, you know, we're uh, maybe here talking to developers mostly, you know, what, what do developers do in this story? Well, of course, they are the people or the group who builds the arrow, right? I mean, of course, we need to do something to let domain experts directly contribute to the software system and to build these systems which the domain experts use. That's our job. Also, of course, there is also always a lot of technical expertise going into these software systems, but we want to make sure that we separate the stuff that we do technically and the stuff that the domain experts do. And it's really important that there is this direct link from the domain expert into the software system. So, you know, how, what, is, what about the reality? I mean, us software people, we have, we have a lot of support, right? I've just collected a whole lot of, you know, here, found that on the web somewhere, a whole lot of, uh, you know, techniques, buzzwords, technologies that we can use and tools. Um, you know, here's another picture I found that, that just helps us be efficient with, all these technical concerns when building software systems and we have great IDEs, very sophisticated systems, very sophisticated languages. So that's actually quite, we're quite productive with that. But the domain experts, they essentially put their stuff into Word or Excel or we build rather ugly and complicated and not very intuitive, you know, desserts or deserts, I should say. Dessert is the stuff you eat, um, you know, of tools. That's, that's really ugly. So. I think these brain slides here are slides that, you know, that contain things you should remember. Um, I think it's essential that the business and domain people contribute directly to a software system and we should give them expressive, productive tools to do so. So that was kind of the challenge. Now let's introduce language workbenches. What are language workbenches? Well, language workbenches are essentially tools that let you know that imp help implement this arrow from the domain expert to the software system. So how does it work? Well, domain experts express their domain knowledge with domain specific languages and then we have generators or interpreters that move the facts and things they expressed about the domain into the software system. Of course, this is DSLs and generators and interpreters. That's really an old idea. I mean, this has been talked about in the 70s. We have done technical DSLs for developers over the last years. This has been an important topic. I've talked a lot about it. So what has changed? Well, what has changed is that language workbenches have appeared. These are essentially tools that let you efficiently build and uh, compose and extend languages. Martin Fowler has defined the term as tools to freely define and integrate languages, uh, persist them in an abstract way, and then uh, define languages as schemas and editors and generators. They are supposed to use projectional editing. I put this question mark here because Martin later uh, generalized the approach also beyond projectional editing, but I'll get back to that. Um, 
and uh, they also should be able to persist incomplete or contradictory information. That's a kind of a detail. Um, and also, I would like to add that you know they should language workbenches should should support powerful editing, testing, refactoring, debugging, and teamwork support. Um, and in the big picture, they should support what's typically called programming and what's typically called modeling. Those two worlds essentially merge into one once we're able to efficiently work with languages. So language workbenches make languages easier, make language development easier. They blur the distinction between prodling, programming and modeling. And there are a lot of different language workbenches, which you may want to take a look at at languageworkbenches.net. You'll find comparisons between those. So MPS is an interesting tool. It's one of these language workbenches. It's open source software, Apache 2.0. And um, it supports all kinds of different aspects of language definition. You can define language structures, editors, type systems, transformations, constraints, but also things like refactoring, syntax coloring, of course, IDE support, and also debugging. It's a projectional editor. So that's one of the tools that Martin Fowler described in his initial uh, language workbench article. So let me explain what this means. In a normal parser-based system where you edit program text, you as the user, you interact with the concrete syntax. If you change something about the program, you change the text. And then there is a parser which takes the text, understands its structure, and builds a syntax tree, um, which you then use as the basis for analyses and for you know transformations, interpretations, all downstream stuff happens on the, analysis, on the abstract syntax tree. Now in projectional editing, whenever you change something in a program, you change it directly in the abstract syntax tree, you still see a concrete syntax, but that concrete syntax is projected from the abstract syntax. So if you look at these two pictures, you can see that in the parsing case, there's an arrow from concrete syntax to abstract syntax. So your, 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 your text must be parsable. Essentially, you can only use linear uh, you know, sequence of characters, whereas in projectional editing, you don't parse, meaning you can use much more diverse notations, and I'll get back to that. So here are examples that you can use in this space. You can use text, you can mathematical symbols, you can use tables, of course with embedded text. You can use graphical diagrams with text in them or text you know, that contains a graphical diagram. Here are the respective screenshots from MPS itself to show that that's not just an idea, that but that is actually something that works. And I'll get back to that in the demo quite a bit. Also, projectional editing lets you mix different languages in one file without any big problems, right? Um, you can, normally when you have several languages and you want to use them together, then you either have them in separate files, separate files and ref refer to one from the other, or when you have them in one file, you don't get a lot of IDE and you know IDE support and type checks and stuff like that because one of the languages is then usually just considered you know plain text. And sure, there are custom editors that can mix HTML and Java, for example, in JSPs. But the, in general, that's that's not supported and it's a lot of effort to build. Now we've built in a in a project called Embedder. We've built over 50 extensions to C, and they can all be used in one model if you want to in one file. And so. Um, Language composition is another aspect that is very well supported by projectional editors. So, to summarize that part, projectional editing provides syntactic flexibility and language extensibility. The usability issues of these projectional editors, where users directly change the syntax tree and not the ASCII text, are mostly solved. We wrote a paper about that recently. You can download it from the Embedder website or from my website. And MPS is great, and I'll get back to that, but alternatives exist. Again, if you go to languageworkbenches.net, you can you can see all these alternatives. So let's look at some examples of um, business-oriented systems, language-oriented business applications that have been built in this in this space. We'll start with a system built by a company called Modellwerk Modellwerkstatt. It's a system built with MPS. It's used for uh, retail invoice checking, cash point controlling, purchasing contracts, inventory management. It has about 40 end users uh, distributed over several sites. I don't know about the size of the system or the data it manages. It has um, about six people who use the DSLs to build the systems, system, and it has uh, 1.5 uh, language developers. I wonder who the half person is. So here is uh, an example of a, a screenshot, and you can see 
it's it's looks like a normal IDE with all kinds of uh, different things shown in the uh, outline view and or in the structure view on the left side. But then here on the right side, you can see code that mixes um, Java code. This is more or less Java code, but it mixes it with higher level um, things for expressing commands. For example, a command is part of a business process. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see that um, there is also processes and there are events that trigger that process. There are states, so essentially they, they modify or they model a process as a state machine. Going a little bit further, you can see again some kind of process step called check-in that contains Java code, but inside the Java code they embed SQL directly. And um, you know you can see that there is also a check-out that's part of the um, process. This is part of the business transaction layer they've built. And what they generate from that is business applications that essentially look as usual um, and uh, these applications are then used by um, you know these 40 different people who manage the system but the developers who built the system have these nicely uh, optimized and customized domain specific extensions to java to efficiently build business applications let's look at a second system that's a system by the Bundesagentur für Arbeit, that's the German de uh, employment agency. I was going to say deployment. Um, it's a system built with Xtext. Um, it um, has 120,000 end users, meaning that the people who use the system we build here are 120,000. Um, it has 60 users of the DSLs. And here's uh, some data about the system itself. It has 5,000 model files, 400 UI masks, 300 business entities, 1,100 op op operations. And it's going to be a database with 8 terabytes, 70 app servers, and 15 Linux boxes. And about 10 people develop the DSLs. So here is, uh, so by the way, that's German. So they decided to make their language um, essentially use German keywords because it's focused towards these, what was the number? Um, 60 people who use the language for build applications. So these are these are uh, correctness constraints. These are rules. If this is the case, then this has to be uh, the case as well. And then um, you know there's an error code that's output in an error text. If that doesn't hold, they have language for languages for building UIs. And um, you know business entities. They have special. Uh, data types for timestamp um, and of course they have booleans finally they also implement operations this way where they have essentially like operations that um, essentially call the base operations almost like inheritance stuff like that now so far we have seen domain specific languages that were used in business systems but these languages were used by programmers now let's look at systems where the languages themselves are used by domain experts. This is a substantial change and it's much closer to what I think we should go to. So here's an insurance configuration tool that uh, colleagues of mine currently develop with MPS. It's used for insurance contract definition. It has uh, thousands of end users. Um, it, end users are the users who will use the artifacts generated from the stuff the business people write down. So the really interesting number is the dozens of people who will use the languages and we have about three language developers. So here you can see a little piece of code, right? This is actually a product definition that uses a lot of pros. It uh, you know, has the ability to insert dates, refer to business entities, but it's all kind of packaged as a nice, you know, as, as a document interface essentially. There are internationalized um, strings which you can have in different um, languages, English and Portuguese, for example. Um, there are all kinds of, you know, summaries and trees and diagrams that are shown that represent the relationship between the various um, aspects of such a product definition. Importantly, these insurance products contain a lot of math. So. Um, we use directly use mathematical notations and um, this is of course much nicer than if you were to try this with prose text or with linear ASCII text. There are also test suites directly embedded 
you can essentially specify test values and expected results and then run these tests directly in the IDE. You don't have to generate anything. You, the business people can directly do this in the IDE. You can have, this is a rule set type that's a, essentially a type definition. Notice how for the various things you can do, you have essentially form fields, right? You can um, put things here, you can um, put variables here, and then if you, you know, if you create a new one, this is when a new empty rule set type already has these um, slots, so it's kind of obvious where you have to put stuff. Here is more. Um, these are essentially conditional assignments. The value flag becomes one of these values depending on those uh, conditions. So you can see how the syntax has been chosen to be very end user friendly. Here is another system that is uh, similarly um, organized, but it's built with the intentional workbench where you again can see a lot of mathematical notations used here and tables for testing products. Again, it looks like Word even more than the previous example to make it friendly to business people. Um, the, another system is um, the system that um, is currently being developed by the Dutch tax agency. They're currently evaluating MPS for this purpose. Um, and you can see that they use very uh, prose text-like rules. Um, obviously, this is in Dutch, and so you're probably not going to understand too much about that. But um, you can see that the syntax is very, very text-like or, or prose-like. Now, let me give you uh, an example that I'm right, building right now as a demo application. It's a business application in the telecoms domain. And for this purpose, I'll sw swap over to MPS. So here is MPS. And this is essentially like a, a table of contents that I've created that lets you jump to the various aspects. So here is a data definition, a business entity. And you can see how an entity customer has a bunch of fields. You can even have derived fields. We use UML notation here. And you have enums. But then entities can also have references to other entities. You know, this is a reference to the address entity. And you can specify the cardinality. And you can say whether it's containment or not. Now, this is a textual notation of this stuff. That's all nice. But most people prefer diagrams. So now here is another data definition represented as a diagram. And of course, you can have a palette here and, you know, uh, define new entities, blah, and then in there you have attributes with, you know, and then you can use code completion here for the types because it totally mixes the, um, it totally mixes the uh, graphical notation here with the um, textual notation inside the boxes. We get auto layout. Right. Let's remove this again. Um, let's go further. For, for some data elements, you want to manage the data right inside the tool and not in the database. So here is, uh, you know, the billing region entity, which is marked as core data, Stammdaten in German, for German viewers here. And uh, you can directly enter records here in a nice table notation, as you would expect, right? So this is very, again, very end user friendly. Tables are a notation that is used quite a bit. We all know it from Excel, and we try to emulate this representation as much as possible. You can then define uh, calculations for, and I didn't implement all of these yet, so that's it's magic here. Um, you can see, for example, that there is a pricing factor that's being calculated, which depends on a bunch of Boolean variables here, and then it also accesses this derived property. I'll talk about that. And then the table is used to derive or to calculate the value. But right? if it's local and the customer is not rebated, then the pricing factor is 0.8. You can also see this uh, gutter notation where we use comments, uh, almost like in Word. Um, and you can essentially attach such a comment here, uh, you know, blah, a new comment. And it, it uses this notation we all know from Word, again, to make it friendly to business people. Um, here is more of these calculations. Uh, imagine that these calculations are somehow related to business requirements, which, for example, are legal predefinitions that come from some, some legal department. You can directly, you know, trace to these requirements. Here is only a very simple example. It uses another 
piece of prose text here and you can attach these traces to your implementation here. You can also see how we use mathematical notations so the business people have a very intuitive way of um, describing um, it's a typo here of describing how to calculate the total price last month that iterates over all the calls and then from each of the calls it grabs the price value. Um, we use physical units, right? So here where you can say stuff like, you know, something is older than 30 days and there are other entities like, um, you know, weeks and days. There is a little problem here right now with the type system. That's why uh, there's an error. Um, ignoring that for now. Um, now, after you've defined these um, calculations rules, calculation rules, the next thing you want to do is probably you want to define contracts. So here is a base contract that contains a couple of calculation rules. You can also show uh, nice documentation in here. As you can see, the documentation can directly refer to these rules. So if you re rename these rules, then you know that the documentation does not break. You can also then uh, you know create new business objects here that are then stored in the database. Notice that this is the base contract which contains a bunch of uh, rules. This one is supposed to be overridden by specific kinds of contracts. So if you look at the flat rate contract, this contract uh, overrides this rule. You can see the little tooltip that, that gives us the original with a new assignment and it's a conditional assignment where it has the condition here and then the values here. Now, sometimes when you have this inheritance between various things in business languages, that's a little bit hard to grasp for some of the business people initially. So it's better if you show them the overall contract kind of flattened. So let's see, you can go to view and show the inherited rules. Now you can see that this contract here also includes those rules. Notice how the original, the overridden rule is not shown, you know, that guy because it's overwritten here. So this is really the resulting contract being shown to the user. You can even show it for a date specific, you know, in a specific date. This is now for the uh, for um, for um, August 20, which includes uh, this rule here, which starts only at August 20. If I change this back to August 18, then this rule goes away. And so it kind of composes automatically the, 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 the contract um, for, for any given date or date region. Um, let's go back. Um, yes, I've shown all that. Now, sometimes you want to, um, you know, assess your code. You want to, for example, find out what is unused code. And you can see here that there are a whole, a whole bunch of rules that I've defined that are not called by anybody. That is because I, uh, you know, because this demo is just a yeah, demo. You can also directly see in the tooltip the actual rule that's not never being used, and um, you know you can um, manage your, your your code quality by having these kinds of queries, and of course you can build your own queries. That's the whole point. Um, let's see, there is more, right? So we have another business language that uses prose text. You know, given anything when the customer call size is equal to ten, and you know there's code completion for all these things, and the call end time is smaller than 20, then set the call price to 20 and execute the cancel contract with the customer. Customer, of course, being one of these entities, um, cancel contract is an operation defined for that contract. So it's totally integrated, but still it uses uh, pros like, uh, you know, end user readable friendly syntax. Um, you can even do code reviews. So if you look at this, I can go to code projection mode and show the code review state. Now you can see that some parts are yellow, meaning the code is finished, somebody has written it, and now it should be reviewed. This code is already reviewed completely. You can even look at uh, an overview, you know, this is all your code fragments, all your stuff that you may want to review. You can see what has been reviewed, what is not yet reviewed. You can manage all of that. So as you can see, this is a totally integrated environment for, for, for specifying telecom uh, rules. And um, it, it uses metaphors from the IDE world and from, you know, document-like uh, systems. So let's go back to my slides. I uh, Obviously, I did show you the demo. So let's look at the big picture. 
So language-oriented business applications, what are they? Well, essentially, you take a language workbench and then you put a bunch of languages in, right? And that's it. And these languages are designed so that they are friendly to end users. And what can they do with these? Well, you can specify business rules, financial calculations, domain data structures, all kinds of data mappings in the scientific space, validation rules, scientific processes, stuff like that. And all of, all of these make up the core business logic of um, applications. So the core really, the, the idea really is that we represent the core business logic directly and not code it or, you know, wrap it in some low-level code. So it's essentially a mix between application development and language engineering. And so applications, if you, if you look at this, why this works, applications are ways to work with data, right? So meaning you author, you read, you analyze, you process data. But what, are, what is data, right? Data formats are almost languages because, I mean, if you look at um, typical data format, it has some structure, it has constraints, it has semantics. And if you add to that some nice syntax and IDE, then you have a language, right? Oops. And so then this authoring, analyzing, composing, you can do all of this through um, language engineering based on top of language workbenches. That's the big idea. So if we compare uh, business people and end user, uh, sorry, business people and programmers, business people like structure. They, um, they like predefined structures. Programmers, not so much, right? They prefer programming languages with which they can express almost anything. It should be flexible. They don't want to be, you know, nobody should constrain me in any way. Business people like mixed notations with tables and graph and, and math stuff. Programmers prefer text mostly for all kinds of reasons, some of them related to infrastructure. Um, Business people like guidance. You don't necessarily want to give them an empty piece of paper and say, now go ahead, write down your business stuff. They actually do like kind of fields and slots where you can put stuff. They do like um, predefined layout. At least they're not against it. You know, I mean, developers have to, you know, put the curly braces wherever they want. <laughs> they want, developers are happy to have only one view of their software, you know, essentially the text and maybe an outline view whereas business people really like multiple views. And it's important that the IDE for business people is relatively simple and clean and focused, whereas a developer has no problem to have an Eclipse with 5,000 menus, menu entries. I mean, this is a little bit um, simplified, but in general, these tendencies that I outlined here are actually true. But this means that, um, that, that, that languages for business people are quite different from languages for programmers. And I think that with these language workbenches that support these flexible notations, we can move the notion of language closer to what business people expect. So it's essentially a new paradigm for applications. Uh, the word language is interpreted liberally because we have all these different notations. In some sense, we mix languages and forms, right? So from the language world, we take expressions, you know, comparisons, addition, stuff like that, code, code completion, error highlighting, version control, refactoring, debugging, all of that. And from the form world, we grab helper buttons, tables, rigid structures, tree views, visualizations, life interpretation, math, notation, graphical, prose, stuff like that. And we mix that in a flexible way. So summary. Um, I started with this idea, right, to have the domain people uh, have expressivity for domain knowledge, user-friendly notation, testing, meaningful analysis, synthesis of software. So how does this now play out? Well, we, we can build languages for a domain. We use um, user-friendly notation. You've seen the demos. Um, for testing, you want an integrated DSL as well. I haven't shown that yet. Unfortunately, I did not yet have time to build that language for the demo. I hope to do that. You've seen it in the screenshots. Um, you have meaningful analysis, type checking, consistency checking, stuff like that. And of course, there is code generation behind all of those systems. I didn't talk about that because code generation, you know, not going to say it's boring, but it's something that has worked for a long time and building a code generator is, is not the challenge, not a problem. So that's just something you do. Now, notice that there is no artificial intelligence going on. The, 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 the process from the real world to the brain of the domain expert that's still manual, right? But then the domain expert has productive means of expressing himself 
And um, for you developers in this world that I'm sketching here, you should become language engineering experts to help build the languages and tools for these people. Um, there's one thing I didn't talk about. Um, business people today do almost everything on the web, right? And um, the tools I've shown were all kind of fat, rich, client, IDE-like things. So what's going on there? Well, um, we need language workbenches on the web, of course, and both the X-Text and MPS teams are working on it, but it'll be months to years until these are kind of robust. You can look at languageworkbenches.net to see some of the other language workbench prototypes, some of them being on the web. So if you have to build a tool for the business environment, consider using a language workbench as a foundation and then kind of recasting applications as a set of languages. It kind of leads to this metaphor of uh, generic tools, specific languages, which is uh, the title of my thesis. <laughs> All of the stuff I've shown so far or so far in this talk is open source. Um, and you can read and learn about this stuff in various books and on various websites. Thank you.